So uh, this question is from FKH. Uh, basically what he's saying is a 60 year old woman with unremarkable past medical history of, um, uh, no past medical history, developed occipital lobar ICH seven days after the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. So I think most of our questions will be related to COVID because it's uh, the situation right now. Uh, CTA and DSA normal, vasculitis screen came negative. Can COVID-19 be the cause of this bleed? Uh, would you recommend second dose or you withhold it? And uh, so what do you think about this? It's an outstanding question. And I get this type of question a lot these days. Um, and I put together an international expert panel publication with a stroke, leading stroke and neurocritical care experts from Europe, um, Asia, and America, uh, cerebrovascular disease, uh, diseases. Uh, I'll send that article to you, Tarek, and then you can share with your colleagues. But long story short, sure. there's a definitely a relationship between COVID uh, virus uh, and inflammation, which has led to not only ischemia, but at hemorrhagic complications. We're talking venous and arterial thrombotic complications. So people come in with a, a venous um, clot, uh, including legs and the brain, sinuses of the brain, as well as arterial embolic strokes out of the blue from COVID infection. Now, I understand the, pan, uh, the, the, the question is not about COVID infection, but it's about the vaccine. But I think we must talk about the virus before we talk about the vaccine. There's a clear link between the viral infection by the COVID-19 virus and inflammation, and inflammation that has, we have seen ischemic injuries and hemorrhagic injuries. Now then, what is a COVID vaccine? Well, it's a messenger RNA not exactly the virus, right? People think that you get vaccine, you're, gonna, you're injecting COVID. No, that's not what you're doing. You're injecting messenger RNA. Now, now that's, the, that's the part of the DNA, RNA, which, which is not, so it has the molecular component of which the immunization will occur and the antibody against it will develop. And when you have a real virus, you will have antibodies to fight them. That's the whole idea behind the vaccine. And in the US, we have seen some complications. The, the good news, for example, I've seen all kinds of neurological complications. Um, someone with a TIA, as well as peripheral Bell's palsy. Um, some people with a centrally driven sensory disturbances. Um, the occipital hemorrhages that you're describing you would need to um, you need to find out whether that was spontaneous. It may be coincidental. I don't believe you can just say vaccine did it, but then again, there is a chance that it might have because it's a messenger RNA genetic you know, you know, analog. Um, so there's a chance that it may be related, and if you believe that it's due to the the first vaccine, then it would be. Um, I would caution against the second dose if that was clearly the cause and effect. Um, no one really knows about this. Uh, another question I get was, should a pregnant woman get it? And, and I totally, uh, one of my PAs were pregnant and she asked whether she should get the vaccine. I totally recommended that she gets it and she got it and everything's okay. The bottom line, in my opinion, however, whether it's a COVID infection or the virus, the complications are not as common as what the news media has been talking about. The incidence rate is really low. So I don't believe, I think the benefits are much higher than the risk. Yeah, yeah I do agree. Thank you very much. I think I have another question related to what you were talking about regarding intracare monitoring and um, from Suela Misfer. He said, in the absence of intracranial monitoring, what is the target blood pressure? Oh, another fantastic, good question. Because as you mentioned, most of them don't have intracranial monitoring. Well, I think that's what the prob where the problem is. You have no idea what ICP is. You have no idea, right? 
But then again, we know CPP needs to be at least 50 or 60. So then, so then what I do, what I do is I sort of guesstimate, make an educational guess. You know, if patient is, say, awake, you know, not all ICH patients are comatose. In fact, a lot of them are awake, right? If they're just, if they're awake and only weak or numb because of the location of the ICH, the mentation is good, then you know the intracranial pressure is likely not going to be very high. So I would just come up with a reasonable normal ICP, for example, 10 to 20. And then I would just add 10 to 20 so that that will be your map, right? So if CPP is 50, that's what you want, and ICP is 10 to 20, then your map should be 70 or 80. So the bottom line is you need to guesstimate it. If patient is comatose, then, then perhaps you should place a bolt or EVD. Yeah. Uh, this question is for both of you, actually, Dr. Kiwan and Dr. Edward. Uh, what is the preferred antihypertensive uh, therapy that would you choose for these patients with ICH? I'll have Edward uh, take a stab at it first. Can, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Right so I, I think it's the one you're familiar with. I'll just, I mean, that sounds like a, a that sounds simple, but, you know, for a long time we used labetalol, um, and then we switched over to facting, faster acting, more titratable agents, not to give out a brand, but like nicardipine. Um, and I think what's most important is that within your stroke system of care, especially if you receive patients in transfer from smaller hospitals, that you use agents that you're both, both parties are familiar with. And what you don't want is to have a lot of PRN bolus drugs being given with episodic hypertensive spikes that may be detrimental to the patient. So picking a drug that, that the group with the system feels comfortable with, not only within your hospital, but also within your region, finding one obviously that's affordable um, and easily titratable is, is probably the, the, my best answer. Again, we, we've used nicardipine, but there are other agents um, out there. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with Ed. Um, the bottom line is that you don't wanna use a PO medication. That would be the worst thing in the beginning. You will have to convert them to PO so that they can get out of the hospital, but not in the beginning. In the beginning, you want to use an IV, quick on, quick off, titratable, whatever agent that may be, IV labetalol, IV nicardipine, IV clavidipine, even IV esmolol, anything that you can titrate and come up with a, a controllable blood pressure rather than PO, God forbid, you give 10 milligrams of something and then that, that hangs around in your body that now you can't really control it uh, without being invasive. So, so I, I totally echo um, Ed's uh, answer. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, just remember this audience, you use what's available for you and if it's not available, push hard the hospital administration to provide it, I guess. Um, uh, this question is for Dr. Edward. Uh, so you mentioned about, the, you talked about the spot sign and uh, people here are wondering, um, how should I, you know, how powerful should I push for getting a CTA for a patient with ICH? Uh, in some areas, there's a lot of constraints and, you know, you have to sign a high risk consent for these yeah. patients because they're getting a, you know, a contrast and they're worried about the contrast induced property and all of that. Sure. So, it, 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 it's a great question. And I think right now, until we have, until we can use it in our armamentarium, there are other features of the non-contrast that you can the scan that will give you an idea that there's something bad happening. Again, the swirl sign, you know, the hypodensity within a hyperdense hematoma gives you a suggestion that there's increasing bleeding. You know, our purpose for doing the spot sign was to identify patients at a higher risk for increasing hematoma expansion or continuing bleeding that we would then act upon as part of studies like with transaminic acid or with recombinant factor 7a. But since we don't have a therapy right now that really works, um, you know, it's, is it helpful? Probably. Is it essential? No. So I think that um, I would not 
I, I would not lose sleep over the fact that you can't get a CTA looking for a spot sign um, until we start finding better ways to utilize that information. If you get it as part of the uh, work up acutely in these patients to see if there's an underlying vascular image and you see a spot sign, then I think it's helpful. But um, to, to expend a lot of cost and energy um, to get it is probably not worth that at this point in time. Yes, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, uh, this question is for Dr. Lee. Um, so uh, Zahir is, is wondering about, is there any criteria for patients where AVD insertion is a must? And is there a cutoff point for conscious level or hematoma size or other criteria that you use? Yeah, so the EVD placement, timing of placement, and believe it or not, timing of weaning it and removing it has been a topic of controversy for a while. Uh, everyone kind of does it differently, and so it all depends on who trained you, uh, mm -hmm. where you got training, etc. But if you think about it, at the end of the day, if you think about it, EVD is in there for one reason, well, two reasons, right? One, it's there to drain, and two, when you clamp it, it gives you a reading of the pressure. So I would say, I would say place an EVD when you need those two things achieved. Do you need to drain it? And do you have to get the pressure? Well, when it, so then when, when, when is that? Well, if you have a, again, a large thalamic hemorrhage, a thalamo-basal ganglia hemorrhage with a severe IVH and hydrocephalus and patient is comatose, well, guess what? You need those two things. You need to drain and you need the pressure reading. So that's pretty obvious. Now, I think when it becomes a little bit tricky is when the bleed is small and IVH is not bad and hydro hasn't occurred yet, well, then you can wait. And, and, and you can make a decision as to be more aggressive or less aggressive. In the hands of experienced uh, operator, insertion of EVD is um, not that hard. Um, you know, don't, don't tell my neurosurgical colleagues I said this, but it sometimes is easier, easier than A-line. You know, if you, if you place 50,000 EVD, it's much easier and subclavian, it's much easier than a trashy vasoconstricting A-line which is close to impossible to put in. So, so you know, it's not, not that hard to place. And, and just ask yourself a question. Do I want to drain? And do I have to have ICP? When those boxes are checked, you definitely go for it. Yeah, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, so um, I believe I have another question for... Um, uh, we have a few questions regarding when to start anticoagulation with patients who have risk for ischemic stroke after ICA. Oh, another very, very common question. That another <laughs> common question. <laughs> you uh, you're gonna have to uh, invite me to another grand round or conference. That that needs another <laughs> whole hour. I, I I I it's it's a it's a question I've at least received ten million times, and I I don't know if I have a quick answer. Yeah there, is, yeah, there is a study ongoing called the Aspire study, which is partially trying to look at this, both with a NOAX as well as aspirin, perhaps, right. as, a, as a safer transition point. So, you know, the reason for bringing that up is to demonstrate that we don't have a single definite answer yet. Right. Um, and there's a lot of nuances to that. And there's a lot of small trials that kind of give us, or small case studies that give us some suggestions, but we don't have a definitive answer for at, at this point. Right. I will, I will say this, though. Um, you know, we're doctors, and we are proud to be doctors, and we think this is not a job, it's a privilege. But I find different types of doctors focusing on different subspecialties they belong to. For example, if you are a stroke person, and, and all you do is ischemic stroke, and that's what you treat and that's what you prevent for, then it seems to me you want to do any coagulation, any coagulation, any coagulation. On the other hand, if you're on the emergency medicine and critical care and a neurosurgical side, you're not really, your job is not 100% of 
stroke prevention, stroke prevention, stroke prevention. Actually, your 90% of your job is actually dealing with those people who are on anticoagulation, aspirin, Plavix, Eliquis, and Rivaroxaban, and then they bleed and then they come to you. So then if you belong to that physician group, then you want to say, well, do I really want to send this patient home on another anticoagulation? You bled again. So I think that instead of focusing on what you do and who you are, think of it as whether a patient really needs it. You know, I don't think anyone knows what's worse, ischemia or hemorrhagic. Quite frankly, they're both bad. Yeah, you know, you could, there's, there's some trials like, you know, the um, retrace trial, for example, that looked at this. And it's a, it's, a, it's a window, and there's an art to this, as Dr. Lee just mentioned. You know, there's, there's, there's not going to be a singular size and probably starting after a week to two weeks. But it all depends on the patient, what their brain looks like, the type of hemorrhage that they had, and a lot of other things. So, um, you know, again, even when we have the data back on large trials like perhaps Aspire, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And so that will be part of the art of medicine for years to come. And it's a collaboration with the other physicians managing the patient. It's with their cardiologist. It's with other patients who are going to be monitoring them long term. Yep. Yes, yes, I do agree. Always make sure that you individualize your uh, treatment options based on your patient's condition. Uh, next question is for Dr. Edwards. Is there any indication for prophylactic anti-seizure in large volume uh, ICH? Um, yes, how long would you, uh, you know, prescribe it for? Yeah, you know, that's not my, my wheelhouse, but I would say not that I'm aware of. I've not seen a study looking at specifically large volume. Like I mentioned before, we saw in Paul Vespa studies and others, you know, greater prevalence of of seizure activity in the low bar hemorrhages. And so I don't know in the large volume deep ones if there is a volume association with seizure risk. I don't know of that. And so I so in my in my ignorance I would say no, but I will defer to Dr. Lee if he's aware of additional data. There, there there's no data. There, there there is absolutely no evidence for supporting for a prophylactic epileptic drug for anything other than TBI. There is a class one data on TBI for seven days of phenytoin because when this randomization study occurred, that's all they had. They didn't have newer agents that are more safer and better tolerated that we have today. So the only data that exists for anything for the brain for the prophylaxis, uh, prophylactic AD is in the setting of a TBI as long as you promise me that you will only do that for seven days and not beyond, there's a zero data for subarachic, there's a zero data for ischemic stroke uh, or ICH, regardless of the location. However, in a clinical practice, though, if the ICH is in the center of a uh, seizure, uh, lowering seizure threshold, and patient is presenting with convulsion, say, an AVM rupture causing an ICH in a temporal lobe. Well, A, if patient is already seizing, that's, I, I guess that's, that's really not a good example because now we're talking about symptomatic, not prophylactic. But even if patient is not seizing, I, I know I would actually want to give a, uh, a, a AD for that person. If it's an AVM rupture in temporal lobe, I, I think I think a, a well tolerated um, you know low drug to drug interaction anti epileptic drug until I get rid of the ICH ideology is not a bad uh, therapy. Yeah. Also, if you if you have a patient with you know an ICH location or as you mentioned a lo lower threshold for seizures and your patient examination is not that good and you're not sure if he's seizing or not. Reasonable. So. It's reasonable. Yeah. So you might start, you might think you know, starting a... Totally, uh, totally. But there's no data for that. Yeah, there is but no then data. Again, but then again, if you only do, well, and if you have data, then you won't be able to do any medicine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Dr. Lee, this question is for you. So you decided to evacuate the hematoma. Is time uh, a factor here? Uh, how soon should I do it? Should I wait? Should I keep the patient for, you know, 48 hours and then, okay, let, let's evacuate now and see what happens or just immediately um fabulous fabulous question 
So if you think about, and, and Edward talked about this a little bit, if you think about the, the molecular cellular pathophysiology of how ICH actually causes neuronal cell death, right? It's different than ischemia. Ischemia, you know, they're already dead, right? Irreversible, sodium, potassium, ATPase, pump failure, a liquefactive necrosis. Guess what? Complete stroke is complete stroke, right? Now, ischemia, that's the ischemia, uh, that's the infarction, but the ICH is different. It's a mass effect underneath which you have a tissue that's not dead yet, but, they, but the tissues will die, the brain cells will die if it stays there for a while through a complex, complex pathophysiology. Um, th therefore, in my mind, if you're gonna intervene, you, you need to intervene early. If you wait a, a while and then intervene, then, then you might as well not intervene at all. There's no data uh, for intervention. So if you're going to do things against the evidence-based medicine, might as well do what makes sense physiologically. Sooner the better. Um, and, and we've seen that from thrombectomy trial, right, for ischemic stroke. So my, all my uh, MISTI-3, which I do routinely, at my center, um, ICH, if you don't do anything, then they might as well stay home, right? The, I mean, they, they're gonna, they come to you hemiplegic and you, you're not gonna do anything. Uh, uh, to me, it makes no sense. I think that they're devastated, right? They have disability. It's gonna become permanent disability. I put in catheter and I suction it out. And, and when the mass effect reduces, uh, their function gets better. And I think it must be, absolutely needs to be done early on, not later on. Great. Um, if you're going to do it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Another question here regarding ABD insertion and the risk of infection. Uh, do you recommend hey. prophylactic antibiotics or not? Yeah, so overall, um, I, I can speak for some of the Asian countries because I... I I've given many talks there and interacted with my colleagues there, as well as my colleagues in the U.S. The overall ventriculitis rate after EVD insertion, the total incidence rate is about 1%. So you have a 1% risk and 99% no infection. So if your center has an EVD infection rate greater than 1%, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, but if it if if falls into the global incidence rate, which is extremely low, then then you know it's you know as long as you put it in a sterile fashion um, and you maintain it in a sterile way, um, and you don't you don't report to your infectious disease colleagues as a <laughs> EVD CSF infection whenever you have a chemical meningitis, like whenever you put an EVD and Y count is thousands and you say oh my gosh i have thousands of white cells therefore this patient has e evd infection no it just means you need to read the book again uh it, it those a chemical irritation csf bloody csf are a part of the blood components being introduced into the csf and do not represent true cscns infection yes yeah totally agree uh, I'll take one last question. Uh, centrally driven sensory disturbance, what does that mean? Please. Yeah. yeah, yeah, what I meant by that is, what I mean by that is, I've seen a number of patients after COVID vaccine presenting, uh, presenting as if you have thalamic stroke. So, so, so that's what I mean by, meant by centrally mediated uh, because the examination is consistent with a central CNS localization, not peripheral. Um, and I've seen those, and that's what I meant. Some of them are true thalamic stroke, and some of them are not. Now, some vaccinated people present with a classic peripheral sensory localization, but some present with a central, like a hand, like omega gyrus, hand knob, you know, numbness. Th those people, uh, uh, people can present like that after vaccination. Yes. 
Well, uh, I think uh, our time is up. I wish that we have more time to take more questions. People are really, you know, uh, becoming really interested in this uh, vital uh, issue. Uh, it's not really as sexy as uh, ischemic stroke, but it's, it's really important to be educated about it. And no, here I thought Dr. Like. Lee, he always uses that word, so that's why he's in his presence. Um, um, any, any last words, Dr. Lee, Dr. Edward, um, before we conclude? No, I, I would say don't give up on ICH. As Dr. Lee mentioned before, there's a lot that we can still do, even though we're, we don't have quite the toolbox we have for ischemic stroke. We're getting there for hemorrhagic, and given how bad these patients do, in the absence of care, that we have great opportunities now and moving forward to really hopefully make an, an impact on them and their families. So um, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank That's you. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for both our speakers. It was a pleasure to have you both. And uh, Dr. Lee, thank you very much for being here with us for the first time, and hopefully we'll have you for many, many talks in the future. Thank you, Dr. Edward, and I'll leave the floor to Dr. Sudeir. Uh, thank you, uh, our guest speaker, uh, Professor Lee, Dr. Edward Lodge. It was a great webinar. Sure, uh, people will go back on the YouTube channel of Minaso to look for this video. There will be a t two CME hours will be sent to the participant tonight, which will be sent within the next two weeks. Thanks again for being with us and hope to see you again face to face. Great. Likewise. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, our speakers and our attendees. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you in our next webinar, inshallah.